Wayne mentioned that we were part of a really, uh, I would say, fairly novel uh, partnership that FAR supported with TNC and us. And I'd like to point out that had it not been for the foresight of Soil Health Institute and TNC, and I think PIPA's in the room, and FAR and Lakeisha, I wouldn't be here today. And I would be quite honest to say SHP probably wouldn't exist today. So that was, you know, you talk about transformative seed grants. Those are the kind that we talk about. That didn't just uh, support us, it fundamentally changed the landscape of soil health in the grower community. And so, uh, you know, it's something we're going to be sharing a lot more in August about what that is, but I'd just like to thank the folks that are in the room because they saw this in the horizon and made it happen. So I am an economist, so thank you for inviting me despite that. Um, first off, before I go in, could I just see a show of hands of who are the economists in the room? Hey, there's a brave soul. OK, great. And statisticians. OK, there, I, I like the reluctance, like the uncertainty. Hmm, I'll have that. Um, I guarantee you will disagree with a lot of what I'm about to share, but I expect that fully. Um, So real quickly, and I, why economics for SHP? So SHP, at the end of the day, is it's one of the first and really kind of broad-scale farmer-led efforts. And it's really unique in that we, I am a National Corn Growers employee. I sit with an NCGA. All of our funding, support, in a lot of ways, like the implementation, it comes from a myriad of folks. But a big chunk of it is our farmers themselves. So our state corn groups, through their checkoff dollars, often wool add us as a line item beyond their other efforts or in, in addition, um, they invest quite heavily, and that's pretty expansive. Why do we exist? Uh, it is really to drive wide-scale adoption of conservation practices. And the way we do that is by partnering with farmers on on-farm trials. And I'm going to talk a little bit about we are evolving, and that's kind of the space and the name of the game. This space is evolving quite drastically as we've been hearing through this. And so we're trying to make sure that we stay you know, kind of on top of that. So one of the areas about why economics matter, at the end of the day, being a farmer-led group, we have to follow the trends that affect the farmers most. And for those of you who work extensively in this area, you know uh, times are not good in a lot of ways. And so I know we've talked about optimism up until now, so I will say I am the, you know, it's economics, a dismal science. I'm generally not considered an optimistic person, so I should probably have that caveat. I'm going to share some of the more downers and why it is that we've pivoted with an SHP. Uh, we are facing over the sixth year of low commodity prices. Uh, there has been extensive information, not just in the US, but we saw up front with Wayne's presentation around what is happening globally. Uh, internally, what we're seeing has been fairly, you know, it's actually quite uh, despondent. We have farmers who are looking at, they might be going out of business. They're not sure how they're going to make ends meet. We're not sure how we're going to deal with some of these weather volatility issues. And there isn't exactly a light on the horizon just because a lot of the trends that we're seeing, be it trade policy issues, weather issues, the combination, they're all actually pointing in the wrong direction. Right? And this is an economist. We look at where are all those macro trends and how do they intersect. And so from our perspective, the big shift that really took place is how do we deliver value to our farmers? Our goal is sustainability, but really the immediate goal is making sure our farmers have what they need to consist and subsist and, and survive. And so really, we're organized around these three pillars. So this is how, who we are, how we're set up, everything. If you want to know how we work, our strategy, everything kind of evolves around these three, starting with on-farm engagement. Uh, our field team is really critical to that. A lot of our field team are farmers. So when I talk about the, the, the issues we're having on the rural landscape, the well-being issues, the increase in farmer suicide rates, uh, I am personally dealing with that through my team. My team is dealing with that on, in, on many intimate levels as it affects our communities and others. And it's actually shifted even more our dialogue of not just what is economics, what is usable functional profitability that's actually going to you know, really make that step change for a farmer that says I can actually maintain this operation and maintain it in a healthy way for now and for future generations. The data and the communication are critical for us, but they're enabling factors in a lot of ways. Uh, together, the three really drive us. Um, one of the things I say often is what I've learned, uh, data is necessary, but not sufficient. And the analogy I use all the time, and some of you who speak to me are tired of hearing this, but it's exercise. There should literally be no one in this room who thinks about their own health and doesn't recognize that exercise, drinking water, sleeping, and eating nutritious food those are kind of basic, you know, those are things we all, we don't even need data, I hope, at this point to know that those are the things that help us to survive. So we all can assume we all have that data. 
Now, if I went one by one and spoke to each of you and said, now, how much of you have adopted and implemented in your life? I'm guessing most of us would fall short on many of those. Well, that's no different. If we really go into adoption at scale, and we've talked a lot about farmer adoption, and we've looked at organizational literature and health, it has to do with a very interesting complex of how these three come together. If you work with someone intimately on decision making, how you get the data, I mean, the data is important, but you also need to have it communicated in a way, and often comes, not surprisingly, from your network. And off, if you look at when did you change a health habit or something, there was usually some interesting triggers. You may not even be able to put the finger on it, but that's really why we've shifted and really kind of doubled down on this model as we move forward. I think uh, many of you have seen this. It's our network today. We spread across 15 states with partner and associate sites. The reason this is important is in the context of what we're discussing about weather volatility changes, you can imagine if I talk to a farmer on one side of our network versus another, I get a drastically different story. With one farmer, it could be, I don't know how I'm going to make this work. I, I just invested in you know, new combine, new equipment last year, and I couldn't plant. Versus we have farmers who actually ended up on the opposite. They're saying, hey, this actually is going to work for us, especially with the fact that you're seeing commodity prices raise. Unfortunately, or fortunately, this is a whole thing. It's a shock in the system. So you have such variability in our, our network. So the same thing that's causing such tension for our farmers, uh, there's a little upside. The Economist did this really well. It had a great article that said all of these trade wars, we, we hypothesize about what trade policies and other things look like. You rarely get to actually study it because nations don't usually do this consciously. But hey, here is where we are. Here is the upside. The thing that's causing pain and tension to the rest of the world is just a treasure trove for economists and statisticians because we have such data. We're testing our theories in a way we actually haven't been able to. On some level, that is actually what's happening right now. There is such data and there's such information in our data sets, um, not just ours, but some of our joint ones, because of the severity and the kind of that perfect storm of so many of these conditions on a policy front, a weather front, on micro and macro levels coming together. So we're trying to also look and, and maybe try to see the positivity of that silver, client, silver lining of this cloud. But that is also what drives the economics behind us. And, and really, I want to get into what that looks like. So I mentioned we have partner sites and associate sites, and this is critical. So SHP was started with under a scientific advisory committee. I think many of you who are there are in this room in some way or form, which is great. So you should see your handiwork there on the left side of the page. That partner site allows for eight replicated randomized trials. So the idea being farmers can actually try these out on working lands, we are able to assess and collect data for five years. So by the way, that's great, five years, actually being able to assess changes over time. Here's a downside. Has anyone ever set up an eight-strip randomized trial on an active farm? Can I see any hands? We got, I can see some of the folks who have actually been involved with us. It's not easy. And if you have topography, if you have other issues, conditions, getting that right is tough. So we extremely appreciative of our farmers, our scientists and researchers, and our field team that are able to do this. But that in itself is actually a barrier for entry for farmers, because you might say, I really want to be involved, but the thought of making that happen five years in a row is something very challenging. So we moved to the associate site model, which is split field. Now, for all of you in the room who know this better than I do, I think the soil scientists saying, well, that's not going to be scientifically helpful. You'll have one point on one side and one on the other. So this is where things get interesting. For our end goal at SHP is really to help wild scale adoption and to help to ensure that the economics are much clearer. Model B over their associate site actually has a bigger driver and impact than the first one does. And that's been a realization for us. That's again, learning by doing. There is value in both, but the value is almost inverted. The data and science value on our partner site, is that's really expansive. The fact that we can go and test what Rob just presented, uh, I can actually bring out some of the numbers. We had very different numbers in our data set, but we compared the trial and the control, which is not the, the treatment and control, which is not what your respondents would be, because most farmers are not actively doing that kind of testing. But that's great for really looking and understanding what are the true impacts and being able to delve into that. The associate site does not allow us to do that. It does a flip. It brings in a high number of farmers who are willing to try new practices Oftentimes, they are not first movers. They're not progressive adopters. They're ideally kind of more in the middle. But we're able to couple that with really strong economic data, especially around uh, trying to help 
untangle a lot of the confounded variables, which can then really piece into what is the decision making that they need to undergo um, as they move forward. Just to give you a sense to, um, this was our, this is actually gonna be updated, but we do have a lot of trials. So another piece of evolution in terms of, if we start, we go backwards with what are the economic decisions a farmer needs to make? And then what does he or she need to see? Well, in this world, again, this is being driven by a lot of what is happening. Diversification is picking up, right? If you're gonna be buffering your risk, and we do this ourselves in our households, I hope, we look to say, where is my extensive risk coming and how do I buffer and diversify in a way to manage it, right? It's a portfolio approach. And so what we're seeing, and we've added now this year, grazing, cash crop, and there's actually a couple more kind of in the pipeline that farmers are asking for, and it makes sense, because if you're diversifying and saying, I believe there are other levers that drive soil health, but they're also the ones that I want to adopt at scale on my farm, we need to represent that. So I'm gonna go into a bit of what, this is the, the boring, I would say, precursor of economics. So every time I talk about data usage and data privacy and data management, most people's eyes glaze over. So, um, but I, the reason I want to drive that home is it's almost impossible to do a thorough economic analysis if you don't get this part right. Uh, this is almost, it's your linchpin. Everything is predicated on the quality completeness of our data. And for large economic analyses and models, this drives everything, right? And there's so many times for those who are in the room who have modeled, who've had to come back and say this model has produced really crazy outcomes and you realize there was a problem with step one, the data was so off. So I wanna just share a little bit about how we are approaching it and what to expect from us, especially as you partner with us, work with us, look for output. Um, because we're farmer-led, that means everything that we release, we actually have to go through a farmer approval process. We have, however, we didn't have one in place until 2019, <laughs> so we just put one in place, and we're going to start moving through that. And uh, so an example is I had business cases in here that I had to pull out last night somewhere around midnight because we did not have approval from those farmers and we are, uh, I think, live casting, or at least this will be on YouTube, just again, because we want to make sure this is comfortable and because our farmers do trust us and probably share a lot more data with us than they would with another group, there's a flip side. We ensure that everything we release is comfortable. So that piece is really significant. Um, the other element here is uh, something I learned the hard way when I joined SHP. I haven't even made it to the year mark yet. My, that's my goal is. It's in a few weeks, so I think I can make it. But um, it was really getting to understand, uh, everyone met when I joined said, well, where's your data? You know, Farmers are asking, funders are asking, researchers are asking. Everyone was asking for something fundamentally different. The way that we needed to analyze the data in a way that helps a farmer make a decision year to year in terms of how you change your inputs or your field, that is not in any way the data that I could share with all of you to explain some of the trends and the information. And that is absolutely not what our funders were looking for who are looking to connect it to broader claims or broader outcomes based on kind of their goals internally on sustainability. So we internally had to make a call that says, well, who do we, push comes to shove, we're still kind of resource constrained, who do we go to first? So we go, we're starting with our farmer. So in August, we're going to have an extensive um, set of summer research meetings. It's when we bring all our farmers together by states and we release their individualized data reports. We're the first time we're gonna do such an extensive release to them, but that's step one. Once that's done, and the state corn groups have seen it, we can get hopefully the go-ahead to actually anonymize and aggregate it and share it with you. The other piece is we do have a power issue, so uh, I will not allow us to release any data that has less than five individuals per in the subset, just because that's the only way to keep it fairly anonymized because we have geospatial data. So it's pretty easy when it gets that small even for you to start to pick out who these folks are. Um, data privacy is such a big issue for us that we have offered to spearhead a large data ag privacy effort. You should be receiving information about it. We will have a convening very soon. Really lucky to have partners like University of Minnesota, Open Team FAR, and there are others, but um, I think, again, that's something a lot of you are involved with in some level. And it's, again, it's a precursor. If we get stronger on how we manage and work with our data, then it directs us in being able to use it better. And the final piece is hypothesis-driven data collection. So here is the other interesting challenge. I always say, bring your statistician in at the beginning and make sure you know what you're trying to do at the beginning. It's fun to data mine, but it may not get you what you want. So we have, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our data set. And so this is really exciting for those of you who are researching, have students. 
This is the kind of data set I wish I had as a stat student. Um, I actually trained a lot of our interns on stats like this. It's a mess. It's extremely complex. It has everything you would want. It's longitudinal. It has inconsistency in measurements. I learned something that I guess Wayne and you folks know. Soil labs change your methodology from year to year. So if you're using the same metric and you look, suddenly you're looking at, well, we also worked with three to four different labs over a different time. It's joyous. Uh, we have sensor data, missing data. Uh, we have non-normal, we have huge amounts of non-normality. So things like ANOVA regression get tossed out the door. Um, so it's a fun data set, uh, and we are learning how to work through it. So what that means is, and this is just kind of how we share, and this is actually open kind of for folks to look at, but this is really what's critical to, here's how we're going to do the economic analyses. We're in the process of it now. Our whole goal is how does it really support decision making, and the bottom line is, Summary stats and business cases are very helpful to check the data. They are not at all helpful from a farmer decision-making element. Uh, and actually, just personally, for my career, I would not release business cases usually without having the trend analysis. And the problem is a business case is a, a snapshot. It can really, really throw off or bias the outcome. And so what we're trying to do is we are doing business cases, but we are going to align them with the multivariate analyses. And here's the other fun that's going to it will look like that. We have four of them, but those are the ones I had to pull because they had uh, identifiable farmer data that we couldn't uh, share yet. Um, so we started doing regressions, and the reason I say this is we have a 15 minutes, which I, am, I have just completed already. Um, it would take me, I tried explaining this to my team, uh, what's a fix to fix model and how we're using that to manage for farmer individual decision making. That in itself took me 10 minutes. So I realized that's probably not the right thing to do. So the other major learning we had is how do we convey this massive information to audiences? This is actually not the right forum. We have to use a lot more of our other channels because it is nuanced, right? There's, I mean, if you're looking at these, you should have a lot of questions. I did, the coefficients are wacky. There's all kinds of strange things happening in this. And you need the time and the ability to do that. So we're actually also looking at on a very so completely separate basis is how do we release this to all of you in a way that you can engage with it, you can use it, and you can give us feedback. Because the whole point of doing analyses and models, it's iteration, right? If you can't give us any feedback back, it's not a static, you know, it's going to be the first shot. So, um, you know, that's it in a nutshell. And I feel like I invited you to a dinner and gave you like the appetizer and couldn't give you the full meal because we had to pull those cases. But I'm hoping that in the coming months, you will get those, but please come to me if you have questions, if you want to receive the information, because we will be kind of pushing it out. Thank you.